Welcome to Data Distilled, a podcast intended to provide some additional insight to the personal side of the data center industry. An opportunity to meet the individuals who design, build, and operate what keeps data moving throughout the world. The objective is to keep these conversations light and informal, but provide a personal perspective to the industry, all while enjoying some spirits during the discussion. Today, I'm chatting with Aina Murphy and Dermot Callahan. Aina's with Yonder Group, a golf aficionado, avid wine drinker, and a 49ers fanatic. Dermot Callahan with Google Data Centers. Much like Aina, Dermot is a golf aficionado and a 49ers fanatic while enjoying tequila on the side. Yeah, thanks thanks for having us, Chris. Um, Super exciting, and it's good to uh, get the personal side of the things. We're always doing a lot of work, so it's always good to to share some how we got here. Um, but yeah, so I've been, you know, in, in the Google realm, I guess, for the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, seeing the market going from small to rather large, as we've all seen the last couple of years. So um, lucky enough to work with Aina for a lot of that time before he departed for, for Yonder. But um, but yeah, it's been a super fun ride so far. Aina, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. appreciate it, Chris. Um, uh, so, as you said, my name is Aidan Murphy. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Yonder Group uh, with responsibility globally for design and construction. Um, and so, ultimately, my, my journey started in the west of Ireland, grew up there, um, started my career in Dublin following my studies, uh, and then moved to the United States in 2008. So, I've been here for 15 years um, and proud American. Uh, at this moment in time, too, as of last Thanksgiving. Uh, but my journey in the data center industry started kind of by accident uh, 2008 when the, the financial crash happened. I was working with a financial institution uh, doing office fit out uh, and uh, commercial real estate. And it was at that time that uh, they diverted the money that they were spending on offices on data centers. So my first project was a, a 20 megawatt facility in early 2009. And uh, that kind of accident uh, ended up in a career. Here, here I am, 14 years later, still involved in data centers and uh, involved in an industry that I've grown to love over that period of time. That that journey took me through consulting. Uh, I was client side on the on the owner side at, at Google data centers for almost a decade, uh, and then over the past three three years or so, uh, built out Yonder Americas and, and ultimately about 12 months ago. Uh, assume my current role uh, as CEO uh, globally for design and construction. So that's what I'm doing now and loving the industry and, and loving what I'm doing and loving where I work. That's awesome. Congrats. Dermot, how'd you get into the industry? Came out uh, the financial crisis um, and I ended up going to London where it was the only place I could get a employment at the time um, for a, a handsome wage of about $20,000 a year. <laughs> Uh, so pretty much work for free. Um, but uh, I did get the opportunity to do some disaster recovery sites. So for the trading floors in London, uh, for some of the larger banks. Uh, so that got me really into a taste for resilience and uh, uh, redundancy required for these types of things. So the, then the opportunity after a couple of years in London uh, was to the company I worked for were, were applying for a role um, uh, with Google data centers. And I was lucky enough to be on the, the team that went and pitched and won that. So that's how I ended up in moved to the US in 23rd, 1st of January, 2013. Uh, and then started my journey in Google as a consultant. Uh, and then so we got hired um, about a year and a half into that commission. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's essentially how we get in. Kind of by accident, but uh, here we are. That's awesome. So, so you both mentioned how you got into it. Explain what's changed in the the amount of years you've been in it since uh, Anna 2009, Dermot around around that same time. What have you seen in the, I guess the, the the maturity of the the data center world that's kind of either affected you or you you want to highlight more than anything right now. You know, I was kind of fortunate 2009 that my First intro to data centers was at hyperscale, 20 megawatt facility at that point in time, uh, which was was pretty big back then. Um, and so I've kind of always had that uh, large scale scope um, side of the the industry. Um, and you know I, I think what 
what I've probably observed over the past 10 years is that when you think the scale just can't get any bigger, it does. Um, and, you know, in terms of what we're seeing over that period of time, it was it was search, it was video, it was social. Uh, now we're seeing an AI boom and, and every one of those increments over that period of time have, have been step function changes uh, in the industry to the scale that we deliver. And uh, now ultimately, you know, with scale comes complexity, uh, but I think the uh, the amount of folk that have entered the data center space, the amount of diversity in the space over that period of time, we've had to we've had to grow. We've had to grow as an industry to be able to support that scale, and that's probably what has changed the most for me uh, during that during that period. From my first memory of you know in the data center market, you know the the buildings were very much built for purpose and no more, right? It was how much least amount of capital to get put into a, a building to get to get megawatts. Um, and they were small, right? They were in the 20 to 30 megawatt ranges. And then, you know, quickly over the years, we went large, multi-story. We figured, we played around with our configurations to maximize the megawatts. Um, so we went, you know, we were chasing megawatts for a long time. So there was a variety of options we had. So going from 20, 30, 80, 50, you know, it was trying to find that sweet spot. Um, and then, you know, as you know, we've, as you mentioned, it, it was a lot of, for in Google terms, it was serving internal customers. So like Gmail, YouTube, search, uh, but now to more of a, a cloud optimized solution that we're looking at and uh, to provide all the, the cloud services required. Um, so that's really pushing, pushing where we're going. And then with the AI, AI boom right now, it's, um, you know, we're, all bets are off to where this is going to go, right? Oh, no, I, I would totally agree with that. So I don't know if I've ever told you how I got into the industry. What, where uh, I got into construction in a totally different way. I graduated college, uh, went to school on the East Coast, graduated college, and I, I was tell me, not, I'm tell not. Me, you tell me you didn't get into the industry the first day we met. No, God, no. <laughs> Good. That, that's a true state. No, I did not. That would have been, that would have been fantastic if I would have. Um, so I, I got like into construction. Though. I got into construction because I was like, I, I played football at a D3 school, which basically was an extension of high school at that time. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, top of the line. I wanted to keep playing, but I knew I was never going to see the professional field in my life. And I wanted to get into construction because I'm like, the closest place I'm going to get to a stadium is if I build them. So I wanted to do construction that way. And and I got out and I did not build any stadiums. I went straight to the education group in our in our office and bounced around several times and you know Doug O'Neill, and he was he was my mentor and, and manager for years, and I owe a lot to him. So I I did a lot what he was doing, and at the time it was the 2010 area, and our company saw a demand in mission critical work that was growing. So Doug and Mike Haverty, another mentor of mine, and Ed Downey, another mentor, they went off and started the group, and I think all three of you know them. Yeah. Um, and it kind of blew up mm -hmm. from there. My first opportunity for a data center was out in California for a small, at that time, it was a small colo provider. And it was great, great cutting my teeth on this. You say your first was a 20 megawatt. I think mine was two and a half megawatts in like a 12 week span. So I basically learned on the fly and we kind of grew from there. And our focus as our mission critical group was growing was how to understand where the opportunities present themselves. Back in 2010, 2011, a lot of colos were were on the rise versus, you know, the enterprise. We didn't have the resume to go get, res, uh, you know, the big enterprise clients. And we kind of grew into that. And then 2013 arose and we had an opportunity and, and we met, you know, a, a large enterprise client. And it's been great to work with them ever since. And we kind of now balance ourselves. So in that 10 years, if I said there was something that was changing the industry, it was how much demand either an enterprise or colo is going to go or even wholesaler now is is balancing what is going on in the industry and that was something we learned regardless of cloud providing or you know call it e-commerce or even crypto those those demands fluctuate and we had to balance between that and that's always been totally a new one and now ai is just blowing everybody up that machine learning so it's it's been a fun ride and you guys deal with those peaks and troughs of the industry probably more uh, more severely than others. You know, we have to. We probably um, 
are getting – not probably. We're getting better at being able to balance that. We have specialists within our group going, okay, that person's going to go you know, focus on – the colo side of it. They've got the, the clients and the wholesalers that way. And, and they're even considered hyperscalers now for the amount of demand that's out there. But we the ebbs and flows is something that was was unique for us to to understand early in our maturation as a as a group. So it's been a fun ride. Um like I said, meeting you two years ago has been just awesome. So it's been what 10 years in the making, I think. The the three of us have, have known each other. So I appreciate everything, which is another reason why we wanted to have you on the first inaugural podcast is because we know who you are. We know what's going on and we love the insight that you have. So thanks again. If somebody was to tell you back then about getting into this industry, what would it be if you wish they would have told you something new that you didn't know since you got into it, Anna accidentally, what would you, what would you wanted to know then that you, that you know now? You know, for me, I think the data center, data center industry as a whole for the past kind of decade or so, it's only now that it's becoming a bit more accessible, visible, maybe more publicly. It was kind of shrouded in secrecy as something that was super high tech. And the reality is, is, is it's not. There are several buildings that are significantly more complex than a data center. Uh, I think there's you know, a barrier to entry was probably the fear of the technical complexity of a, of a building and, and, and a product. And um one thing that i really like about our philosophy here is around um you know make that building as simple as possible um and so i probably you, you mentioned i fell into the industry accidentally I, I probably if i was looking for a role in data centers at that time probably wouldn't have applied uh out of the uncertainty of the technical requirements but now you know being in the industry learning as you go uh, there's some phenomenal you mentioned a couple of awesome mentors you've had and Good friends of ours there you know that there's so many people willing to help willing to teach uh you get the right people with the right attitude to enter this industry i think there's incredible opportunity here so for me it's, it's maybe have a little less fear of the technical requirements uh get engaged in the industry seek out your mentors uh, and, get, and give it a whirl Dermot, how about you yeah i think i think similar right it was it was a for me i'll, I'll always remember you know, going out on that flight out on the 1st of January uh, in 2013 and thinking, what the hell am I doing, right? I don't know nothing about data centers. I, I, But that was the fear of like the technical aspect because these were shrouded in secrecy and you, you'd see pictures on the internet about a Google data center or, or whatever. Um, and then like wondering, do, will I know what's going on? Um, but, you know, the key is just being a sponge and asking lots of lots of questions, you'd be surprised that if you ask a question, many people don't know the answer. But if being able to find who knows the answer and learning from it and being that sponge, um, that really helped me. And you know, it was day one when I met Annie. It was like, go talk to these people, and that was kind of what I kept doing for the last you know ten years was just not be afraid to ask ask the question to somebody because you'll always learn something. You know, that's probably one of the most underrated comments to the mission critical world itself in the data centers. It, there is a fear of unknown, um, but once you're into the industry, everybody's out to learn and get better. It's not, uh, I wouldn't i wouldn't call it entrapment. When questions are being asked, it's not to set somebody up. Everybody's eager to learn. Um, it's not the, it's not rocket science. You always hear that. People get really worried about trying to get into this industry because it's very technical, and it is, and so are a lot of other industries. But each individual that we've worked with and our company works with, we align on our values, and we want to learn and grow together, which is one of the, the best ways for us to scale up is to find those people that are eager to learn. It's it's not for everybody, but it, there is opportunities to grow. And I have been, you know, in my, in my short past of mission critical work, I've had some very good mentors. Like I mentioned, Doug O'Neill, um, Ed Downey was phenomenal in his intelligence. And I now have peers I, I rely on that were that grew up under Ed Downey um, and they're great. Client wise, I would say Brett Rogers was one that I, I really enjoy working with on a, on a regular basis. And he's he's a very intelligent, eager individual. So I've I always loved working with him too. Yeah, well, I'm fortunate that I still get to do that. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, obviously during our time at, at Google together, but now it's a, he's a, he's a great mind. 
and someone that really understands how that facility comes together piece by piece from, from grounds up. So, you know, I think we I think we've been fortunate, you know, Dermot, myself, yourself, Chris, that we've had a lot of mutual folk, mutual mentors and, and folk that we've had access to over the past decade plus uh, to, to grow together and to, you know, to call to understand the landscape, how things come together. And, and those relationships are, are vitally important as, as we grow together in the industry. So there. All right, let me let me flip the script here and go to some some kind of off script items or what I would consider not data center specific. What this is this is going to be fun. What questions have you asked Bard recently? I would say Chat GPT, but that's probably not 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 allowable. I just say no to my fiance, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm going to pass this the end until I until I actually open up Bard and see what the last question was. I'm uh, I'm I'm not ashamed to say this, but I'm going to try and keep it as cryptic as possible. I was doing homework with my son and he had to write a speech and I gave it the parameters and I said, can you write me an introduction speech for this? And it it provided one. Now, we didn't use it, but it definitely gave me what we were looking for. Um, so it was it definitely does do a lot. And it's 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 not necessarily scary. It's more eye opening than it is anything else on on how the. These language models know what 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 to provide. It, it is pretty it is pretty impressive, and, and you know, I've, uh, certainly lent in and, and learned what, you know the, var the variety of different language models that exist and, and for for a variety of different customers. And um, I think the two that probably spring to mind that I've used um, with success was one writing a best man speech. Um, so I did that for my brother uh, a couple months ago, and, and certainly um, got I a little. Knew it was, I knew it wasn't all you. It couldn't have been you. It came off too good. Uh, uh, that was maybe one, and then probably the other one, uh, most recently, is job descriptions. I think you know we all have a flavor of additional technical scope adding to job descriptions. We've got the standard ones off the shelf, but in an evolving world, uh, uh, I think Bard and ChatGPT pro provide a good check and balance there. Uh, so there are two use cases that I've used recently. I was the same. I did a, so I did, I did a test on it. I'm just looking back at my history. I asked it to write me um, like a cost management manual just to see what it would spit out. And it gave me a pretty good step-by-step -step way of how to manage costs from project inception to completion. And it, I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty quick. And then I've also used it for, you know, filling out the job description stuff that you know you you want to just stay away from the off the shelf stuff as much like just see what else is there um i have a new role coming up recently so our analytics that i've like oh let's see what bard says what are the key things and some i got some stuff i didn't think about it is it's interesting to watch it watch it develop itself here all right, here's a here's a technical question to get back into the industry market with AI and machine learning driving much of the data center markets. What do you see as being the next technology that will radically shift the data center market? I know we're still in the I'll call it the inception of AI and machine learning, but is there anything that you could see out in the forefront going that's going to be a, that's going to be a major player? Yeah, for for me, uh, I think you know the question is obviously. Uh, a little premature given that we've just started the AI bubble, you know. But in terms of demand, what for what we'll see the facilities growing over the next, you know, months and years being built for. Um, certainly, quantum's out there. When the timing of that and what that would look like, uh, un largely unknown at commercial scale at this point. Um, that that being said, you know, when I when I think about what's the solve for the scale that we're at with even the near term, it's it's really power and, and it's the uh, the challenge that all of the global providers are going to have around sourcing and locating uh, the cleanest power in the right locations at the right time to, to cater for the demand. So you know, that's probably the, the major challenge that the that the industry is facing even in this shifting market. Okay, so to stay on that, to stay on that, Anna, that's actually a great point. Um, have we entered an arms race to see who can provide the most capacity? And is there a particular advantage you see one provider going to than another? Is there something that that they will focus on that can get their, you know, leg up in the industry? 
Yeah, for, for us, I mean, the, the strategy around, you know, we focus on single tenant hyperscale, we deliver, own and operate our facilities, and uh, we really focused on doing what we say we do. Um, so the, the entire program is built about around being repeatable, dependable and predictable, standardizing our product, executing with that product and, and delivering when we say we are, we're going to deliver. And, and obviously that takes, it sounds really simple. Um, it takes a lot of strategy, a lot of planning, a lot of uh, investment to, to make that happen. And we've been fortunate uh, as we've been scaling the business here to, to be able to have that investment, that support you know, to set those up for success. And I I think, you know, it's, it's um, a challenge industry-wide that we've seen global supply chain, COVID, a lot of challenges. And you, you can't really do things the way you could do them 10 years ago, six years ago. Uh, and so being able to plan your work effectively, partner with your top suppliers um, in order to, to deliver um, and being being predictable and, and delivering what you say you're going to deliver. I think that that for us has been a differentiator as, as we've grown uh, recently, Chris. So. Is it, it's safe to say, at least from, from our perspective, when we're talking to clients, is there may not be a singular approach to go through these days just because of the way the supply chain management's going, the, the lack of labor resources that are out there. There's uh, now sustainability, and I shouldn't say now, sustainability's emphasis is becoming bigger in the mission critical world. We're having to adapt that with clients and tell them and provide them those solutions rather than just expect it to be one way. It doesn't work out that way when you can only rely on a single thing. For instance, modularization and prefabrication may work in one industry or market, but a stick build option may work in another based on the availability of resources. We're trying, we're seeing that and having to communicate that. So I think you're right on there, um, Aina, on the on the way the supply chain and labor market is is really affecting um, what's going on. I, I remember years ago, you provided a comment to me of the way the industry is going and and how you as a client were going to operate where you were going to change the economics in a community and we've seen that just the the growth that's going on people are seeing that you're seeing it more in the press recently than ever if data centers are being more public and more visible than they used to be which good thing bad thing or not it's it's there and i think we all need to respond the right way yeah i think by and large it's been a good thing right it has showcased all the good we do for the communities and communities we operate in. Um, I think it's an important thing. It creates awareness. It creates, it makes the industry a little bit more accessible as well. Um, so obviously some challenges arise, but by and large, I think it's better than being shrouded in secrecy. You know, every, everyone uh, here depends on a, on a data center, whether that's their phone, their computer. So I think creating that tangible connection uh, to everybody, I think is an important benefit. I read a really interesting article last week before where it, you know, kind of talking about making data centers more mainstream where potentially in the future, like towns and cities will be built around like a Google and Microsoft, a, a Yonder, like those facilities will be the focal point for the town itself to grow um, and provide jobs and uh, e-commerce to that local market. So it was a pretty interesting article that just, made me think that it's more than just, you know, delivering data. It's actually, it's facilitating a way of life for people too. Uh, and they were talking about like large towns and cities will be ultimately built around these big corporations. I'm glad you bring that up, Dermot, because there is something that we're trying to, you know, we try to emphasize as well as a company. And I think, and this isn't just singular to JE Dunn, but I, I I do think it's one of our core values that aligns. It's fantastic is within those communities and these larger projects that are happening that that really kind of you know make an impact on the community. J Dunn's goal is to make a lasting impact on that impact on that community. If it's through the relationships we've formed with the client and the trade partners and the local labor force, or if it's simply a, a sustainability side, we are trying to make that lasting change. That has become more of a emphasis. Um, from clients asking us, how are you going to make that lasting change? How are you going to impact my community in a positive manner? We're not there just to build. We're building a community. And that's it's awesome that the the data center clients we work with are focused on that. I'm going to go back to the AI side of this. Um, you talked about an article you read, Dermot, about uh, you know where things are going. 
on the AI side of it, there is still division. And I think within our clients, internally, there's division on how AI is, is being handled, treated, operated. There's, you know, the technology leaders are like, there is a lot of harm with artificial intelligence and, and the way the machine learning is going. Others are saying, I get that, but there's a way it needs to be deployed. How do you think that division within the, the tech leaders and the industry itself is going to affect what's happening throughout construction or the development and, and operation of these data centers? Like, I think, I think it's like, no matter what is coming, right? Uh, we're, we're we're not going to get away from it's, it's it's on our doorstep right now we're at the start of it um like there's going to be a lot of probably legislation uh put around uh, the use of ai i'm assuming uh in the future but you know when we look at it internally you know we we still have to provide for our our main products as well right you know the google products that we've always provided for plus our cloud customers so the 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 ai bit is it's going to become the larger portion of our business probably in the next you know five ten years but so there's a balance there between you know supporting the, the current business operations while making investments into the ai market and making the wise investments right it's you mentioned arms race and i've heard that terminology being used a lot more recently and um, people say it's gonna be won or lost in the next couple of years M maybe true right um but, but I do think that, you know, there has to be some level of regulation around it. Um, like another one, I, I, I'm a bit of a geek when I do this, but I, I was reading an article on BBC yesterday. In China, kids in schools are wearing uh, like these electronic headbands that tap into their brain and it sends a notification to the teacher whether or not the child is engaged or not. And it sends their parents uh, a notification. And so basically in a hour class, they can see a distribution of how engaged their child was in that hour. I am um, so happy that did not exist when I was in school. I would be right. disengaged the I, entire time. <laughs> I, I, will, I will find the article and I will send it. It was, I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, that would that just blew my mind. But th this is the stuff that ultimately happened with with, with where technology going. But we would never finish school in if we had those things in our heads. <laughs> I, I, they would not pass me to the next grade. They'd be like, I don't, he's never here. He may be physically here. I'm pretty sure the lights are on, but nobody's home. <laughs> yeah, put 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 one of those on when the Kansas City Chiefs are playing. You're oh, really I'm you'll be really engaged. I'm I'm focused at that point. I'm gonna try and pick a defensive part at that point. Mahomes already does it anyway, so I don't need to worry about that. Yeah, let's not let's not go there. Those on the, <laughs> staring at my Niners stuff here. Yeah, we're keeping that. For All right, me. I got to keep it light again. Uh, is there any podcasts or books you're reading that one shape who you are in the industry or just personally? Um, I would probably pick the two that I listen to. Uh, Probably the most masters of scale. Reid Hoffman, uh, enjoy that one. Uh, and um, the Diary of a CEO, Stephen Bartlett. They're probably the two that I enjoy the most from a podcast perspective. And I think they share good insights. They've got good guests on there, share their experiences, how they how they grew businesses, how they failed, uh, how, what they learned, how they tried it again. Um, so I think they're probably the two that I listen to the most. Nice. Dermot, anything for you? Yeah, Masters of Skills, one I think Anna got me onto it, actually. Um, you know, Reid Hoffman, he gets a lot of really good guests, um, like a lot of CEOs um, of these large corporations. So talking about their failures and how they've learned from them and then roll them into the next, uh, you know, company they're trying to build up from scratch. Um, and then I just... I, I flick through YouTube for TED Talks uh, and and look for, you know, we're looking at Google. We have a lot of resources, uh, Harvard Business School articles and stuff like that there that I'll I'll dive into, you know, if I, if I like a title that piques my interest, I'll read those. But I'm visual, so, you know, TED Talks are good. You know, you can get a lot of information from there. What about you, Chris? Uh, 
Reed Hoffman, I do listen to. I think that's Master Scale. I'm going to. I need to get into that uh, a little more. There's Patrick Lencioni. I really like his books. Um, the The Six Types of Working Genius is a book I just finished, which I thought was phenomenal. Uh, I had my group read those, and I'm trying to trying to implement that um, in terms of are we putting people in the positions that they want to succeed? That they they find the you know their greatest energy doing this type of work versus this type of work. Um, so I thought that was a great one. Um, highly recommend that if you haven't read it, it's it's a quick read. I've read his other one, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which is kind of that, the inverse of that, which is a, an interesting perspective. Yeah, read the read the six working geniuses, six types of working genius, and you'll you, it definitely is a flip to it. Um, so, so it's so it's Chris, a great one. So, so Chris, which which type of genius are you? Uh, it's, that's a great question. My 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 two favorite, or my I guess my energies come from. I am a galvanizer, meaning I like to energize groups, called a glorified cheerleader. Um, and I'm I'm an implementer. I like to I like to work with teams uh collectively. So that yeah. was that was mine. I could see that. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty good, good self assessment. We'll give you an A yeah. plus on I appreciate that. <laughs> um all right, let's see here. What other okay. Now this is a fun one. I usually ask for top five. This is gonna be this is gonna be a great one. It's top five, but we I don't want to go too long because it could get into longer stories. And I got a beer to finish here. You have you have three concerts you can go to. Alive, dead, that happened in the past, it was real, it wasn't real, or you want to create it. There is no wrong answers here. And just because of the timing of what's going on right now, I wanted to go see Jimmy Buffett Perfect. Key West. Oh, you know, you That's, know we had- you know, we had tickets booked for his concert that he, the, the the tour that he canceled when oh. he first got sick about six months or so ago, and I I regret that I've never seen Jimmy Buffett live. I I've seen him live once, but that was here in Kansas City, and I want to go see I wanted to go see him at Key West. So rest in peace, Jimmy Buffett. That was one. Um, I really think I kind of cheat here. I always say um, I would like to see a combo of Elton John and Billy Joel. Um, that's combining them. And then I'm going to go real old school, real nostalgic. I would love to see Elvis. I think it'd be awesome to see Elvis. So those are the kind of things that, that I always ask that. And it always, it always brings out the personality and the individual when you, when you, when they answer and there's no right, right or wrong answer. And one of my favorite things that happens is it'll be about 10 minutes into it. And you go around a group and somebody says something and they're like, ah, man, I would have said that one. It's like, they, they can never get, you can never get it right, wrong or indifferent, but it's always brings out the personality. Totally. Um, Elvis is a good one. I, t- I toured Graceland mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. And, uh, that is definitely a good one. I think for me, um, one Irish musician that I've never seen live is Christy Moore. Uh, and so I would definitely, I need to check that off uh, the bucket list for sure. Um, I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of, a lot of really great shows. I think if I, who else would I add in there? Uh, Jimmy Buffett, you nailed. And then um, next week I go to see Ed Sheeran with my wife. So, nice. Yeah, first time. He's pretty good. He's, he's, I'd, uh, he's, you know, he's I'd, good I'd probably give a shout out to uh, you know my time here and and as uh, my friends have have grown in the United States, I've gotten a bit more into U.S. country. Uh, so probably listen to a little bit more U.S. country music. Uh, and I got to see. George Strait a couple of years ago, the king himself. So, um, if I was if I was giving you five, that would have been on mine as well. Yeah, that's top five for me. You think of any Dermot? Yeah, I think you know, looking back, it's probably more in the not with us anymore. But like Prince would have been up there uh, as somebody I would love to have seen. Um, Elvis was a good one. Uh, you know, Queen back in the day would have been fun one to go. Um, that would have been a, that's always on a list I hear from people. Yeah. And I don't know, newer stuff, you know, same same thing. I've been fortunate to see a lot of things, but I don't know. Something like Adele or Taylor Swift might be a fun one to go see these days. You know, the, the tickets are crazy, but be interested to see how, how good of a show. Uh I'd be more interested to see what the show is like for those. Um I think you know, you've been to Katy Perry before, right? And that was a good show. Uh huh. Yeah, the, the the shows have definitely changed over the years. It's not just about the music; it's, a, it's about the, yeah. the entire the entire performance that comes with it. It's a great production, and rather, it's not just the music that's celebrated; it's actually the production of it. Yeah. 
Well, that is awesome. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up. We started the conversation this way. One, I want to say thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope I hope we uh, we uh, get to do this again in the future. Um, if you have a drink of choice. What is it? Hmm. Depends on the occasion. <laughs> uh, OK, that's fair. <laughs> If on your a typical typical Wednesday night, what are you gonna what are you gonna have? Wednesday night, I'm gonna have a glass of red wine, or I'm going to have a reposado tequila on the rocks. Uh, I am a tequila fan. Yes, I would, I would probably maybe stretch to a homemade margarita, and um, would you like a glass of red wine too? Yeah, we're pretty pretty similar there. I think we're all aligned on the red wine. I definitely would go for a glass of red wine, but I'm always partial just because now my wife is starting to drink it with me too is a good Irish whiskey. She'll drink it neat with me and it'll be it's always a it's always a good one. And like I said, I'm a simpleton. You you pour pour two fingers of that and it's it's good to go. Chris, that's one one constant that has remained since the first day I met you. So uh, I can certainly appreciate your love for Irish whiskey. Slightly embarrassed that it's greater than my own, but uh, <laughs> you remain consistent there. Uh, it's one of my favorites. The problem is the bottle just gets emptier and emptier, and you're wondering where it went. And you're like, what? well, don't tell my wife, but I just go replenish it, and she doesn't really realize that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a really good bar downstairs, right? So I do have a fantastic bar. It is, it is a great time, great party place. So. Uh, I do enjoy a cocktail here and there, which is kind of the name came from data distilled. I always like to have a cocktail. I think it's a good social thing and not to go overboard, but it, it does help socialize situations. So I appreciate you guys talking. Cheers. Thanks Great. so much, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for